morning, everybody. Uh, let's settle down and take our seats, please. Uh, first of all, for those of you whose packets did not include a description of the paper topics or the research guidelines, uh, there were some available this morning, but we've already run out. So uh, apparently the, the problem is bigger than we thought, and I'd like to know how many of you still don't have the paper topics or the, uh, the guidelines. Okay, looks like uh, maybe only three or four. So those will be made available to you by the end of this lecture, so you can pick those up after the lecture. Well. Uh, we've got a, a great day of speakers lined up for you, and um, one of our most distinguished speakers for this year's seminar is Mr. Patrick Anderson. And I think this lecture is uh, important to us because, as you're probably aware, uh, Michigan's economy has been struggling recently. And there's been a lot of uh, publicity about that, but uh, I think we in Michigan don't necessarily need to pick up Forbes magazine to get a sense that somehow uh, we need to be doing better. Now the man who's going to speak to us uh, this morning is probably uh, the most qualified person to talk about what Michigan can do. He's been giving advice to uh, local governments, to state governments, uh, to, to um, corporations and so forth about how they can improve their competitiveness, um, how they can develop economically. And he is a great resource for the media around the country. He's published in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, it seems like every, every week in the Detroit news or, or he's being quoted on, on one topic or another. Uh, he's a very good resource for us as well. And I hope you'll have plenty of questions for him when he's done with his talk. I must warn you, however, that uh, he has another talk to give immediately after this one, so uh, there may not be a lot of time for questions and answers. So have your questions ready for him. We'll get those done as soon as we can, uh, but we might have to uh, uh, let him go slightly before the, uh, the end of the period. So uh, will you help me welcome Mr. Patrick Anderson? Thank you, Dale. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Northwood University students. Northwood is a great university, and I, I'm, I'm glad to be back and uh, see some old friends at Northwood and also see some uh, new students. I had a, had a brief discussion with uh, a few of you this morning. I know which I'll do avoid during questions, and uh, uh, am ready and, and happy that you're out there improving your skills and doing something to build Michigan's economy of the future. So uh, we're gonna go through today a few items. We're gonna uh, brief introduction, talk about Michigan's economic condition, talk about what we can do to restore, restore competitiveness in two areas, taxes and education, and we're gonna have some conclusions. I understand you're writing a 500 word essay on this. There will be plenty of material that will be covered today, and there's some other things you can get from our website. And I'm gonna ask each of you to take a copy of your 500 word essay, of course, turn it in, then send a copy to your state legislator because they need to hear from you. Okay, a brief introduction about our, our company. Why do, we, why do I feel so confident about the advice that I'm going to give uh, you and the state legislature and state leaders? Because people hire us to give this kind of advice, as Dale talked about it. Uh, we have uh, clients mostly from the private sector and all across the country. It includes a lot of the big auto companies here and auto dealers, and uh, also includes universities, governments. People ask us for advice on where to locate their business, what to do with the prices, how, where, what the size of the market, how to set up, advocate a tax policy that helps it work. We can't afford to say things that are foolish to our clients. Our clients are private sector people. If we tell them foolish things, they don't hire us again. This is different from a lot of the advice you hear in government because there are some people who are, appear to be paid to say foolish things in the state capitol. We can't afford that, so the advice we're gonna give here today is the same kind of advice we give our private sector clients. 
Let's talk about the Michigan's uh, economic condition, and I'm not going to dwell on this, but we'll talk a little bit about the auto industry, about employment, about unemployment, and about income. And so give us a diagnosis of the problem. First, see Michigan's auto industry, and what you see here is our production and employment in Michigan. And, and uh, no surprise to anyone here, the auto industry is cyclical. It tends to go up and down. But you can look at this chart and see our employment in Michigan. You see, go back in the 80s, we are in a 20-year decline in overall automobile employment in Michigan. 20 years now. It's not, I mean, I, we have to accept reality that this is a business that's highly capital intensive and there's worldwide overproduction and every single automaker is getting more efficient at producing automobiles, which means that you are gonna have less employment to produce the same amount of automobiles. And even though we're selling quite a lot, and uh, people may not realize it, but we've had some of the best sales years for units sold in the United States ever in the past decade, 15, 16, even 17 million units. The fact is that employment in the automobile industry is on a long-term, slow, secular decline. So it is not a situation where we had a bad quarter or a bad year. We have a secular decline in employment in this industry. We have to deal with that. Let's go to our next slide and look at Michigan payroll employment. And this is just in the last year. And of course, you see manufacturing in the far left. We've had a huge hemorrhaging in manufacturing jobs. But what, I, what this chart shows is that we're not just losing manufacturing jobs. We're losing payroll jobs in industries like trade, industry, wholesale and retail trade. We're losing it in services, especially compared to the United States as a whole. Services, the business, professional, technical services, industries that a lot of you are in or are going in into are gaining about 3% jobs per year nationally. We're barely getting in. And in fact, we have one area over there that we gain jobs, and that's health services and education, and a good chunk of that is government jobs. So when I look at this, I mentally add the, the education and health service to the government line, which includes federal government, and basically what you see is, in Michigan, the private sector is losing jobs, the government sector is not. Now, if you bring this back out further, and you do what my uh, colleague Dave Littman has done, and you compare the number of government jobs you have to carry, or the share of government jobs you have to carry if you're a private sector employer or an employee, this figure gets very scary because over time, what's happened is a larger and larger and larger share of your paycheck implicitly goes to paying for a state or local government employee. The fastest growing area in there is schools, local government schools. We'll see about that a little bit more. Let's take a look again at, now at unemployment rates. And here, I, 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 actually, there's a little glimmer of hope in this because I've done the chart all the way back into the late 70s. And you see, we had 20 years of Michigan having higher unemployment than the, than the nation. And then when you got to the 1990s, we actually did major policy shifts. And when we, we elected John Engler. I uh, worked for John Engler as an appointee of his for a, a brief time in his first in the, his first administration. There were significant policy changes. We actually eliminated entire sections of the state budget. For example, general assistance was, a, was eliminated, other things. It wasn't always pretty. In fact, it was rarely pretty. And there's certainly, you could go back and quibble about some of the policy changes, but there's no question that we reduced generally the size of government, we reduced taxes, we reformed school finance. What happened in the 1990s? You can look at the unemployment rate. We started the decade with an unemployment rate well above the nation, and we'd had that for 20 years. By the end of the decade, we had a 3.9% unemployment rate. You can see that there's a little red line here. We're below the nation. We're better than the country at the end of the 1990s. Well, that was only seven years ago, and just seven years ago. And you see, when we went into a recession, our unemployment rate went up, like everybody's went up. There was nothing unusual about that. We have a cyclical economy. When the national economy gets bad, we're gonna tend to get bad. In fact, we'll get bad a little worse. But historically, we've gotten better when the national economy got better. And what's happened in this decade? What you see is first, 
we stopped being better than the country and got to be just, just where the country was. Then we opened up a gap. We were worse than the country. And then the gap got big. And now we are, along with states that have been ravaged by a hurricane, month to month, either the worst state in the country or second or third worst in terms of unemployment. This is a very serious problem here because we are talking about how bad the Michigan economy is in relatively good economic times. Right now, in 49 states, this is a good economic time. A few of those states, it's a good economic time where you're rebuilding from a devastating hurricane, but it's a good economic time in 49 states that are buying our products, that are generally keeping folks working here. If we don't turn our ship around before the next economic downturn, we will be in very serious trouble right here. So you look at that, I see a couple things. One is, it is possible. We did it in the 1990s, we turned ourselves around. It is possible to turn Michigan around. Second, if you follow the policies in the 1990s, maybe not exactly, but general in direction, you say we're gonna get our taxes down, we're gonna get our government performing, you have a chance to do as better, as good, or better than the other states. And then you look in the current decade and you say, what happens if you decide you're not interested in improving your business climate? You will not do major improvements to your government services. You fall behind. And, you know, people can observe that in the year 2000, there were both Republicans, and since 2000, there have been both Republicans and Democrats in charge at various times. This is not a solely partisan observation. It's an observation about what actually happened. In the 1990s, we tried to turn the ship around, and we did. In the current decade, we, by and large, haven't tried. If anything, we've tried to run our ship into the shoals. And we'll get to that in a little bit, okay? Our next uh, one here, this is a depressing slide, no two ways around it. This is median household income. When we do work for private sector retailers in particular, so some of you probably work or will work for companies like this, people who are selling cars, people who are selling furniture, appliances, what you typically look at is the median household income and the household income of people in that particular area served by the retailer because that's households are the units that buy things typically. You have so many cars per household, ovens, etc. People look at median household income and they look at it adjusted for inflation like you look at it. And what you see here just in the decade of 2000, and this is a decade that had a recession after we had uh, September 11, 2001, and other very tragic events at that time, we had a recession in the United States and median household income did drop as you would expect it to. And since then it's been trending up a little bit, kind of moving out. But in Michigan you see an unambiguous decline. And this is only through 2005, right? So you can imagine the 2006 red dot on this one is not gonna be as high as the 2005, it's pretty clear. We have, in just six years, moved from being a relatively wealthy state to a relatively poor state. I don't like to say this, but it must be said, we're now a poor state. Our taxpayers earn less than the average state taxpayers. That's reality. We're not poor if you compare us with the rest of the country. All of us are very fortunate. I myself consider myself a very fortunate man. We live in a wonderful country. All of us have enough to eat. But compared with other states, we earn less. That matters. When you earn less, you buy less. And that means you buy less of all the goods that your employers want to sell, all the services. It also means that you can afford to pay less for government services. And that's an area of adjustment that we haven't made yet. Okay, go to our next slide here. Uh, now let's talk about that and we'll go right to where the rubber meets the road in terms of the, the government taxing you. And we're gonna talk about business taxes. Last year, the House of Representatives under uh, Speaker Craig DeRoche commissioned our company to do three benchmarking studies. We're gonna talk about two of them, business taxes and education. And uh, Darcy handed out that sheet there that has the 
links. You can download them, all of them. All of them have the data in them, the comparisons, the methodology. You can look at them yourself. And our, our charge here was benchmark Michigan against the top 10 states. And this is what I think is a good charge. Look and see what the best people are doing in your industry and match them. That's what Ford does, GM does, Chrysler does. And in this town, if you pick up a newspaper, if you don't care about the auto industry, you can't avoid the fact that our major auto companies know they're in a battle and are trying to win. They may or may not win, they don't win every battle, but at least they know they have to give the customer top quality or else there's a whole line of other car makers that want to take their business. And that's the same thing in restaurants. It's the same thing in hotels. It's the same thing in every other business. Customers deserve the best service and they're gonna go get it. If you don't give it to them, somebody else will. Same thing for government. Let's see, how did Michigan do? We're gonna take a look at how did Michigan do in business taxes and what have the citizens done about that? Well, surprise, surprise, Michigan business taxes were higher than they are in the average for US states. And the particular business taxes, the property taxes, the single business tax that gets lumped in with corporate income tax licenses were well above the national average. In fact, if you look at these key business taxes, Michigan's among the top 20 highest tax states. Well, that's not where you wanna be. We're in Stanley Cup season. You wanna be in the top bracket. You don't wanna be sitting on the sidelines right now. You go into the playoffs, you wanna be in the playoffs, not out of the playoffs. This is the wrong place to be. What did we find? Well, we said, what would it take to get in the top 10? Now, this is what, all of you are here because you wanna improve your ability to do work for your employer, for yourself. You wanna improve your life. You want to get better at what you do. This is what we told the state government. If you want to be in the top 10, you must reduce business taxes between 1.3 and $2 billion. And guess what? That's what it takes to match Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee. Now uh, you can look at this list, and actually we have, and uh, if, you, if you download that report, you'll see we actually went out and said, what are these states doing? And we noted that some of them have been successful in getting, say, auto plants. So all of them are successful in getting more jobs than we are. If we wanna be in the top 10, this is what it takes. Well, let's talk about one thing that's been done and that's the citizens here. Uh, if you observe like I do what uh, our elected officials say they will do and what they actually do, you would note that politicians from all stripes have promised to repeal the single business tax for the entire current decade. Democrat, Republican, whoever ran for governor said they were gonna repeal the SBT going back into at least 2000. Somehow that didn't get done. Well, uh, I, I joined with Brooks Patterson, some other folks and said, we gotta do this because people in Lansing won't. And last year started basically in February and by August it was done. I mean, it was an amazing thing. The citizens banded together and repealed the state's major business tax. Uh, and the way we did it was with an initiated law petitions. Probably some of you signed it. Over 300,000 people signed it. Over, uh, almost 300,000 signatures were certified as valid, which is what you needed. And then both houses of the legislature passed it. No governor's veto, no governor's signature under our constitution. So now we finally have one of the sorest thumbs for our business climate repealed the end of this year. Now what we did here was we said in the repeal law provisions, very interesting, this is uh, something that, that we worked on. It says right up front, First sentence, the purpose of the law is to repeal the SBT and encourage the legislature to replace it with a less costly tax. If you sign this, if it was passed, you saw it, you don't have to look on the fine print. It's very clear what the citizens wanted. They wanted a less costly tax. There's a zero rate after December 31, 2007. We affirm the obligations of both taxpayers and government until then. So we actually thought about this. Yes, you do have to pay your SBT this year. You can't not pay it. And hope that the law is gone. And in the same way, if the government owes you a uh, refund, they can't wait till December 31 and say, oh, that law's gone. You still have to do it. Uh, and interesting, whole law, six sentences long, that's it. Obviously, written in East Lansing, not Lansing. Okay, 
Uh, and of course, now we we have some uh, some replacements, and we're not going to go over tax policy specifics here. We're going to talk about direction, and this is two main directions now. The citizens said, repeal the SBT, give us a less costly tax. Here are two major contending directions. First proposed by the governor, adds taxes, including a Michigan business tax, some personal property tax relief, creates a new tax on assets, tax on assets, creates a new tax on business to business transactions. This was the so-called service excise tax. You may have thought it had to do with haircuts. It has to do with you hiring an accountant in your company or an economist. Tax people like that. That would be the, that's the proposal and it would be an overall net tax increase. Okay, that's one. Alternative, Michigan Chamber, put a 3% tax at business income, a half percent tax on gross receipts, give some personal property tax relief, and reduce business taxes by $500 million. All right, now if you're sending your essay to your state legislator, here is a question, what side are you on? Do you think that Michigan should raise business taxes at the current time, move itself further away from the top 10, but allow us to spend more money on government, or do you think we should reduce business taxes, encourage more employers to stay here, try to save the jobs we have, but inevitably mean that we have to cut, tighten our belt a little bit more for government? It is a current debate. This debate is happening right now. And if you have an opinion on it, please don't keep it to yourself or share it with your neighbors. Send it to people who are paid to represent you. Okay, next one. So I have an opinion on this. Uh, my opinion actually matches that of the governor's hand-picked emergency financial panel. This was the panel that was uh, headed by two Democratic governors. I mean, one that was uh, Governor Milliken and uh, Governor Blanchard. One was a Republican when he was in office. And uh, uh, they, hand-picked by the governor, concluded unanimously that government spending needed to be restructured, that they had a structural deficit. They didn't have a bad year. They didn't need a patch or an accounting gimmick here. They had programs that were designed to spend more money than our tax system is designed, even in a good year, to take in. We cannot run our government the way we have the last few years. We've gone through the rainy day fund. We've securitized our tobacco revenue. We've done multiple accounting gimmicks. We've unconstitutionally run deficits. We can't do this anymore. And I think you saw, you, you may have seen the state treasurer say that he may have to, to, to stop paying checks, paychecks. They actually talked about payless paydays. Uh, they talked about shutting down parts of government because in the current year, they don't have enough money to spend on their current year budget. Well, this, this is now something that everybody agrees on. Governor's handpicked panel said two key areas where we have to reform. One is in the government pension and benefits, including for K-12 teachers. They must be brought in line with the private sector. In fact, they use the word benchmarking. They said that pensions and benefits in the public sector ought to be benchmarked against those that people in this room get in the private sector. Makes sense to me, I entirely agree. It also said Michigan incarcerates far more people than other states. One of the, after education, one of the biggest areas and fastest growing areas in our state budget is for prisons, corrections. We spend an enormous amount of money on this. We have to spend some, it's a fundamental uh, obligation of government. But there are people like myself and like the governor's panel that are saying, why are we incarcerating so many more people than Ohio or Wisconsin, our crime rate is, and it's not like our crime rate is lower. We're spending a lot of money here. We need to do something about it. The panel said we need structural spending reforms as well as a tax increase. I agree that we need a structural spending reform. I'm a little dubious on the tax increase for the reasons we talked about there, other than an infrastructure. Let's go to the next uh, slide there. All right, let's talk about the second main area of competitiveness, and that's education. All of you are here and you all understand how important this is. 
In today's economy, we don't have the opportunities that Henry Ford and Ransom Olds and others gave us almost a century ago here in Michigan where we could take people who may not even know how to speak English or who had part of a high school education and give them a middle class, upper middle class lifestyle in the auto industry. That opportunity no longer exists. You must have skills and you have to have math, computer, reading, English. You've got to have these skills and you have to be able to do things that give you the ability to produce a lot of value added so you can be paid a lot. That's what it's all about. Let's talk about Michigan competitiveness. We did a benchmarking study on this. This is the one that's mentioned in the Detroit News uh, editorial today. We looked at participation and attainment, demographics, finance, student performance. This is just benchmarking. We didn't say how to run schools. We just said, how are you running it compared to the other 50 states? Let's see what happened. Why do we do it? Obviously, you want high wages, well-trained workforce. Well-trained workforce and productivity is more important even than taxes. I mean, there are, there are places that have the lowest taxes. If you notice those top 10 states, we picked out the top 10 lowest tax states, but we said, what do you need to do to get competitive? Productivity is what makes it happen. That requires good education, particularly a K-12 and higher education system. And we focused here on K-12. And what did we find? Well, let's start with spending. 10th highest spending in the country. 10th highest. This is 2002. 10th uh, highest at over $10,000 per pupil, over $1,000 higher than the average. In 2002, our spending's gone up since then. And I'm not begrudging this. I'm not saying we shouldn't spend high. I think this is very important. But what did we get out of it? Well, one, one, one thing you look at is, does the more spending get you more teachers with people in the classroom? No, in fact, we have lower than average teachers in the classroom with people. Something's going on in the system. Let's take a look and, and, and how performance was. Well, we didn't do well. In fact, we did poorly. Uh, for top 10 spending, we got 30th out of 50 in math. We got 31st for reading. The only place where we were even close to the top 10 was in science at 13. We're 27th for writing, so for top 10 spending, we could get at best average results. That's not good enough, and I wanna, I wanna point out to you how bad it is. In math, the top 10 states get 37% of their students to pass math tests. Math, this is the national, national, it's a NAEP education attainment. Okay. National test given, same test given to a sample of students in every state run by the U.S. government. 37%. This is nothing to brag about, by the way, folks. 37%. That is the top 10 states. This is awful. This is why people look at the United States and say, we, we're falling behind countries that have per capita income half of ours on this. Michigan only did 29%. All right, so think of now, next time you, you could drive home, you drive by high schools or schools, think in there, 8%, that's the gap between us and the top 10 states. That works out to be 128,000 students in the system right now, 128,000 fewer students can pass a math test in the Michigan system than if they were system were just performing where the top 10 states are. How about reading? Well, it's 157,000 students fewer. That's the performance gap. And again, that's just to get to 37% of people passing a reading test. In science, I said earlier, this is our, this is our high point. In science, we're only 85,000 students behind. Uh, that's how many it would take to get to 60% failing the test. Uh, and in writing, here we are, again, 200,000 students behind. Uh, this is, in my opinion, a terrible picture about Michigan. And it's not very complimentary to the United States of America. If we want to be 
an economic powerhouse when China and India and Taiwan and Indonesia, South Africa, emerging, emerging economies in Africa and Asia, when they, in Latin America, when they get their systems together as we hope they do, where are we going to be if we can get in the top states 40% of our students to pass a math test? I don't want to be there. So now you folks in this room are part of the solution. You're doing your best, but if you're upset like I am, be sure your essay, this page, gets copied. Okay. Right, let's go to our next thing here, our next one here. Uh, we're going to go to conclusions, and then we'll have uh, uh, some opportunity here to answer some questions and go over in some detail the items that we've talked about here. Conclusion number one. Michigan's economic condition is worsening. Remember we saw that, that unemployment chart? First we were ahead of the nation, then we're a little behind, then we had a gap, then our gap got better, bigger. Remember the unemployment or the employment by industry. It's not just autos. Yes, we're losing auto manufacturing jobs. There's a 20-year secular decline in auto, straight auto jobs. We're not going to turn that around entirely in Michigan or in the United States. But Michigan's problem is not a bad year, and it's not one bad industry. The auto industry is an industry every state would love to have. I'm glad it's here. Yes, there's a decline in employment, but there's no necessarily a decline in productivity, income, importance, technology. Our economic mess is not something we can blame on one industry. Conclusion number two, if you want to be a top 10 state economically, you need to get competitive on your business taxes. Companies like our clients, companies like your employers, your potential employers, they look at how much it costs to get productivity in one location. There are 50 states lined up to roll out the red carpet for the next five or 10 big plants. If the, and the front end of your red carpet is a big sign saying, pay lots of taxes if you step on this carpet. These people are smart enough to figure that out. And even if you come in and say, oh, by the way, we're going to give you grants and other things and ameliorate it, I mean, you might buy some time or get a few people to step on the carpet. But it is a competitive world out there. If we want to be competitive, we have to reduce the burden we place on business taxes. We did some things with that with the SBT repeal, but the citizens can only do so much. Now there's a debate on this. Do we want to be a big tax, big government, poor state? That's the direction we're headed right now. Do we want to become a competitive state that means that we can't have as big a government? I think we want to be a competitive state. I think that's our only option to go ahead. Otherwise, we will stay a poor state. Conclusion number three, Michigan's government needs restructuring. Governor Blanchard says this, Governor Milliken says this, Patrick Anderson says this, I think even the current governor. Everyone agrees finally, we've kind of hid ourselves from this from six years. We have known, people like myself have known every single year the last three years that the government adopted a budget that involved spending more money than our current resources we're gonna bring up. And it, not that I was keeping it a secret. Lots of people said this. Everybody knew it, but we've patched it together. We've sold things. We've done accounting gimmicks. We can't avoid this anymore. We need restructuring. What does restructuring mean? Not that you uh, keep the same programs, promise the same amount, and do it poorly. Uh, that's typically what I used to work for Dick Headley. He would say uh, things like, oh, they want to cut spending. They're going to let half the air out of all the basketballs. Right. That's not restructuring. Restructuring, as you say, we're doing 10 things poorly. Let's pick eight and do well. Obviously, we have some things we need to do well. We need restructuring here. All right. Next conclusion. If education is the key to the future, we should act like it is. The, that data I showed you, I mean, that was just ought to make you cry. 40%, that's the top 10. All right. You're here because... It's obviously not acceptable to you. For you and your family and your future, it was not acceptable to 
stay with the education that you had two years ago. You wanted to do better. Your employer encouraged you. You encouraged your family. You want to do better. Well, we need to do better. As a state, we are failing here. We're not doing mediocre. When you are, when you are getting 30% of your K-12 students to pass a standardized test and you're spending top 10, you are failing. It's not like you need encouragement. You don't need a self-esteem boost. You are failing. You need a reality check. And I hope all of you will deliver that. Business leaders need to demand performance from the K-12 system. Uh, this I have to give some criticism to business leaders. Many business leaders have never been to a school board meeting, have never talked to a school person. They give money to the booster club. When the kids come around and ask for money, they, they do that. And they pay their taxes. And obviously, paying your taxes and giving some money is a good thing. Uh, but you have to be willing to tell somebody that 40% is not good enough. And this is something where I think business leaders have to say, we, we can't stay and do what we've been doing for the last 10, 15 years while the ship's been taking on water. You have to be willing to ask tough questions of people who, after all, work for you. These are people we pay $16 billion a year for our K-12 system. I don't, I'm not recommending we spend any less. It's OK with me that we spend top 10. I just want top 10 performance. And actually, this is more important to me than the other items, because this is our future. We need to demand performance the same way that you do in your own life and in your own business. We should be demanding this from our education system. Continued failure is not acceptable. You need to have this in your mind. I can already see from talking to you, this is what you think about yourself. If you think that about your state, be sure to tell somebody about that. If you think being the laughing stock of the country is something that you enjoy, I mean, I don't think any of you believe that. I don't. We can turn Michigan around. We proved it in the 1990s. But we need to take some action now. And the big thing that has to occur is that people like the folks in this room need to tell their elected officials that they are impatient with their lack of performance and demand the same kind of performance from them that you would anybody else that you send $40 billion a year to. So that's my presentation for you today. Thank you for listening on this. And we go there. Next sentence. And then, Dale, I got, I got some time. We can go over some, some questions here. And I'll, I'll just call your attention. All three of our benchmarking studies here are on our website, on the Anderson Economic Group website. Go under uh, Publications and Press, and there's a little report library. You can get all of them. You can get the entire text, the executive summary, and the data. You can check how we're doing against Minnesota, Wisconsin, uh, you know, California, how much we spend in each one of these areas. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, okay, first of all, before we start, okay. I want to advise our students, we're going to be more disciplined with this microphone today, so even if Mr. Anderson calls on you, you wait till I get to you with the microphone, please. <laughs> okay. Okay? <laughs> uh, I always thought that the uh, government ought to act more like the private sector. I mean, you never see them cut back when times get tough. You know, if a business gets tough, they start laying off people. They cut until they bring their costs in line with revenue. Uh, government seems to never lay anybody off. They just, you touched on that, but they, they, they continue to spend. And then when times get good, they add more people. When times get bad, they still got the, the cost from before. But you hit on something I've never heard anybody hit on, and you didn't really explain it. And I want to ask this, because I think it's the biggest cost gone forward for all local governments, state governments, federal. The, the legacy cost that's going to come from these retirement plans and pension plans that are in place. And, and what's happening in the private sector, people have already realized they can't afford that. They're doing away with them. I mean, IBM did completely away with its pension plan. All companies are doing that. You see Ford and GM trying to do the buyouts to get out of some of these future uh, responsibilities. Why does the government feel like they've got to provide a retirement plan for years to come with escalating uh, inflation, uh, 
benefits when the private sector is all gone to 401k, meaning they're encouraging people to save their money with a match, a conservative match. I mean, it's not in the private sector. Why, why, why does the public sector think they're supposed to provide these benefits? All right, good, good question. And Darcy, can we go back to the restructuring slide about the recommendations for that? You are right. Uh, private sector companies have been dealing for the last 10, 15 years with what are euphemistically called legacy costs. Uh, and we have a very serious problem. I mean, with General Motors, Ford, I mean, it's an enormous problem with Delphi. And you've started to see companies like, I think it was United Airlines that offloaded some of those on the taxpayers through the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, some bad things that have happened there. Uh, there was some progress at the state government level. The state government went to a defined contribution plan back in the late 1990s. So one of the changes that went on during the tenure of Governor Engler is that we, we adopted a modern, sustainable pension plan for state government. But we continue to have, in local government, particularly in the local schools, a benefit structure that is absolutely unsustainable. And uh, when your hand-picked panel for a Democratic governor says specifically that pension and benefits for K-12 employees need to be brought in line with the private sector, it is so bad it's almost a scandal. Uh, and in fact, part of what the reason that you saw, I mean, we voted, by the way, last year, there was actually a ballot proposal, I think it was Proposal 5, to lock in more spending on, on this to actually raid the general fund to pay pension costs, uh, and, as well as pay the, the current uh, K-12 system out of the school aid fund. But that was decisively rejected by the citizens. Uh, this is an area where, uh, I mean, there... It's debated up in Lansing, but there is, with the K-12 system in particular, there's a favored health care provider favored by the dominant teachers union in the, United, in the state of Michigan that also controls the provider. It's MESSA is the name of the provider. They're a third-party administrator. Uh, they have a monopoly on that, and the legislature has been unwilling to break that. This is something that can't be sustained. So you actually have teachers, we're spending more and more money, and our, sa our teacher salaries are, are quite high, but a large chunk of the spending increases in this sector go right into that, right into that system. So there is an area here where you're absolutely right. The state itself, state employees are now more in line with the private sector. But uh, in the local government, it is totally out of line for the K-12 system, and it is something that we need to do something about. I'd like to ask you a question also um, about the, the benchmarking studies that you did. I've heard the governor talk about Massachusetts as a model, um, talking about how you can spend your way to competitiveness. Uh, do you want to comment on Massachusetts or some of these other models where that have been thrown out as, okay. Spend your way into prosperity. That's like buying extra things on sale, right? It saved money, yeah. <laughs> lots of extra things, okay. Uh, well, I don't believe that we should go to a n zero government model. And I don't believe necessarily we should have the smallest government in, this, in the United States. Some people do, I, I don't. What I want is what customers want. They want performance for their dollar. And if you look at, uh, let's go back to the education slide, the, the one about uh, the gap between us and the top 10 states. One of the top 10 states in, in education performance is Massachusetts. I don't happen to know where, where, they, where their spending are, but let's assume that they, like us, spend a lot. Well, there is a difference. They spend a lot, they get a lot. I'm okay with that. All right. I mean, and there's some things in my life that I spend a lot on because I like it, and but I better get it. All right. What really bothers me here, well, first, what really bothers me is that as a country we accept 40% passing a test. This is just terrible. But at, from the point of view of just Michigan and what we can do now, there's no way if we're spending a thousand dollars more per student per student than the average 
that we're sitting here and we, we're, we're 100,000 students behind in, in most of these categories, sometimes 200,000, a top 10 state and what Massachusetts can do. Somehow Massachusetts has got their education system, so at least by American standards it produces. We're so far behind in this one. Our system's clearly not working in K-12. Uh, elsewhere, though, Massachusetts is not, you know, not a particularly job dynamo. Uh, the more interesting comparison that Governor Granholm made is with Virginia. She recently gave a talk in which she highlighted Virginia as a model for, uh, for economic dynamism. And in fact, Virginia is a model for economic dynamism. And uh, if we can go to our business tax states slide here, Virginia and North Carolina are our benchmark states for business taxes. If we can match Virginia or North Carolina, we can go to any company and say, you're in the top 10 most competitive business tax states, come on down. Right? And we, we would get those jobs because businesses generally, they don't want the absolute lowest on this. They need the, they need the workforce, they need the location, they need the suppliers, the cluster of technology. They want all these things, but they don't want to pay extravagant taxes. And so you need to be competitive. And here's North Carolina and, and uh, Virginia, and that $1.32 billion is calculated off of how much it would take to get to Virginia. Virginia actually reduced their taxes. They did some tax changes. They did some restructuring. Good for them. And I think they, they gained 200,000 new jobs during the time period. And it's in, our, it's in our benchmarking study. You can actually see the jobs. So uh, if we were able to do what we ought to do, we ought to say is, hmm, on education, we need to match Massachusetts. We're paying as much. I don't know if we pay exactly as much, but we're, our, we're in the top 10 spending, so we're clearly paying enough. Let's match the performance. I think in our, our, uh, our new superintendent, Mike Flanagan, he, he has the uh, state superintendent. He wants to do that, so I, I give him a lot of credit. We just adopted a curriculum, 2006. We adopted a curriculum. Okay, we're a century late, but we adopted one. Uh, and uh, so he, he, at least I give him credit, he wants us to move down the field and is willing to say to schools, you must teach kids math. That was not a requirement a couple years ago. You know, you could get the $8,000 a student and you would not have had to, to teach them math. Uh, now we've got a curriculum that requires that. Uh, so. We should be matching Massachusetts on education. We should be matching North Carolina and Tennessee on business taxes. And we should go through and match the best performers in every category. Now, this is only what every single auto company does. I mean, I'm sure some of you have been in these, some of you probably work in, in these places. If you're, if you're at Buick, you have a Lexus outside and you are matching that for noise, vibration, and harshness. If you are at Chevrolet or Saturn, you have a Honda there and you are matching that. And you know what Toyota's doing? They're taking an F-150 and they're trying to match that because they pick the best in the category and they aim for it. And that's what winners do. In every field of human endeavor, they try to match the best. What are we doing? We're explaining away why we don't have to be good. I'm not, I, that's not, that's something I'm willing to put up with and I don't think any of you should either. Okay. Um, interesting. Thanks. You guys need material, so I know that. A I'm just referring back to my notes, a couple things you said and maybe you can help me understand. You mentioned that the, uh, the chamber in their proposal for replacement of the SBT comes up with about a $500 million or half a billion dollar tax cut. At the same time, in Michigan, it seems from the information you presented that the only growth sector we have for jobs is the public sector. <laughs> so 
how do you how how is it squared that we cut half a billion dollars, which will can only inevitably lead to unemployment, more unemployment in the one sector that's actually employing people, increase unemployment even more. But then what are we what else are we cutting? You mentioned, I think uh, you said instead of doing ten things poorly, let's do eight things well. Which two things are we not gonna do? And I know it's it's an example, but what things what kind of things is the is the chamber or you or the experts out there proposing that we cut? Because from what I understand there's not a heck of a lot left to cut. It was a lot of things were already cut and and uh, uh, there's always fat in government, I know that, but where, is, where are the cuts going to be, and will it affect middle class, lower class, upper class? Who will it affect most? Okay, two questions. First is, if government's adding employment, why shouldn't we raise taxes so we can add more employment there? And if we, conversely, if we reduce taxes and reduce government employment, does that mean we increase our unemployment? That's just the first question. And then second one, what do you do about uh, how would you implement the recommendation that I'm making that's consistent with the recommendation that the governor's panel made that we restructure government, meaning that you would reduce spending or eliminate programs or eliminate some of the, some of the actions that government does? Let's take the first one. I mean, this is basically goes all, goes all the way back to fundamental macroeconomics and fundamental microeconomics. If, in fact, we could spend our way to prosperity, tax all of us, and hire, you know, hire government employees who would, of course, work, get paychecks and pay taxes, income taxes themselves, would that be a success or not? Well, we, we have empirical evidence on that because basically the United States took the approach relative to Europe that it would keep its taxes lower over the last 20 years. Europe is at negative population growth. Europe has to import workers. Uh, Europe is a laggard in economic growth. And by Europe here, I mean the traditional Europe, not the extended Europe that would include um, former Soviet republics, Poland, Turkey, uh, uh, places like that, Slovenia. Uh, other republics that are joining the EC or NATO. Uh, so the empirical evidence is very clear, and the economics are, are also clear. And you look at, say, Joseph Schumpeter or any of the people that talk about the incentives on individuals, Friedrich Hayek. Government does do a good job at certain things. It's the right way to handle certain things. It's the right way to handle military defense. It's the right way to handle a judiciary. It's the right way to handle police. I think it, it can be the right way to handle most of the transportation, not all. Uh, and as a society, we've decided that we want to have a public education system, K-12, and it's in our Michigan Constitution also that that's what we want to have. Uh, so we've decided we want to have these public bodies, and I, there's no recommendation in, in my presentation that we rethink all those items. I think we should have government perform these duties. But it's very clear that government does not do a good job in a whole range of other things. Let's start with a short list. One, government does a terrible job of picking winners and losers. Terrible. Uh, and we don't have to look back at the checkered history in Michigan of things like the Strategic Fund or the, uh, what was the most recent one, the 20th Century Job Fund, just, you know, starting to come out where the connections between people that got these grants and the, the folks that made the grants. Uh, you can go back to the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. I wrote an article for Cranes, actually, the first issue of Cranes Detroit Business was on our history then, because in the Blanchard years, we decided we wanted to have, or the governor at the time, wanted to have an industrial policy uh, that had the government taking a government fund and loaning money to upcoming businesses that it selected. And of course, the taxpayers would pay money to support the fund. And so we went back and looked at the history. The history of this was terrible. What happened, we tried that uh, after the New Deal in the United States. 
We had a federal government bank, essentially. It made loans. Guess what happened? Surprise, surprise, the people that got the loans were politically connected. They were very good at politics. They weren't very good at business. They got the loans. Finally, the, I think it was the U.S. Senate finally put the kibosh on this. Said we're not going to have a, a government bank that picks winners and losers. Uh, Michigan, actually, if you go back into the 1800s, Michigan said, hey, we've, we've got it figured out. The future of the economy, canals. You know that, I, I, one word, plastics, well, one word, canals. That's what it was in 1800. So Michigan actually took taxpayer dollars and invested in canals and railroads too. And, and you know, canals and railroads were in fact industries that, that were important and that, that grew, but having the government run the canals turned out to be a disaster. And uh, it was so bad that it almost bankrupted the state. And now if you look in our constitution, we actually have a provision in our state constitution that the state shall not subscribe to the stock of any private entity. Why do we have that in there? You might wonder, why do, why do we have that in there? We had it because we tried it once and it was a disaster. So if you think about that, not only empirical, but in terms of what government's good at, it is not good at creating jobs. It is not good at running businesses. It is not good at picking businesses that will do well. It's failed in Michigan, it's failed in the United States, it's, been, it's failed everywhere it's been tried in the world that I'm aware of. That doesn't mean government shouldn't be there. It should be there for the things that government does well, where we need to pool our resources to do something for the benefit of all society. But going back to Adam Smith, I mean, individual farmers choosing the best way to till their fields will do a better job than the government agricultural board that hires the best experts telling them how to do that. If that wasn't the case, we would see North Korea wealthy, not South Korea. If that wasn't the case, we would have seen West Germany capitulate and become East Germany. Uh, if that wasn't the case, we would have seen the United States fall behind Europe instead of the United States do better than Europe. So it's very clear that if you want your economy to grow, you need to unleash your entrepreneurs and your private people to do what's in their self-interest and is also in the interest of society. And if you're like me and like most Americans, you want to have a government that also provides a, judici a judiciary, provides for military defense, provides some other essential services of government, then you tax these people and you run the government as it should do. So that was, that was your first question. Now, your next question, you said, well, Mr. Anderson, you said that, that we need to reduce taxes to become competitive, and doesn't that mean we'd have less money to spend on government? And my answer is, in the short term, unequivocally, if you cut taxes, you have less money to spend on government. However, if we don't cut taxes, we will have less money to spend on government because our economy is in a tailspin. We have a structural deficit now. We've had our treasurer talk about payless paydays. We've actually discussed openly shutting down organs of state government because we can't pay our bills in our current fiscal year. All right. So the current strategy is failing. You know, there's that statement, you know, what's the first thing you do if you find yourself at the bottom of a 10-foot hole? Who, who knows the answer? Stop digging, right? <laughs> okay. All right, you know the answer. Okay. Stop digging, okay? We need to stop digging. We have dug ourselves into a hole and we are continuing to dig. And if you've dug yourself into a hole with a high tax, big government strategy, you should stop digging. And if you're out of line on business taxes, you need to stop digging, right? Put some, you know, start putting some of the dirt back in the hole and getting close to the top. Does that mean you have to restructure the government? Yes. The governor's hand-picked panel said we needed to restructure it, and, and I pointed out two big areas here. These are not small things, and Jen one back there pointed out. The pension and benefit costs in the K-12 system alone are so out of line, it's an enormous amount of money. 
in which, when I say enormous amount of money, not just that we spend an enormous amount, but we spend an enormous amount more than what competing private sector employers do. And on the, on the uh, judicial system, or on the, on the correction system, there's no question we spend way more. And I don't have a specific suggestion on how to deal with that other than to agree with the, the governor's panel and agree with some other folks that have looked at it and just say, there's no reason we should be incarcerating a substantial fraction more of our population than Ohio does at enormous cost to us and enormous cost to our society. So those are two areas that I can give for you on this specific question. Okay. Do you see any real economic benefit to initiatives such as the Cool Cities initiatives that the governor has put in place? Or is that just a bunch of useless spending? Okay, so the way you asked the question, was there any benefit from it? And I'd have to say there's some, okay? Uh, I do think the ability of the state government to identify cool things is limited. Uh, and you might want to ask yourself, do I want my state government telling your city they're cool and his city that it's not? Because in effect, that's what happened. We had cities that said they were cool and file applications and didn't get any money, and so I guess they're not cool. What's that, the Uncool Cities uh, <laughs> initiative? Well, uh, but, you know, that's more of a, I mean, it's really, on the whole scheme of thing in the $40 billion state budget, it's a relatively small amount. But I think your, your bigger question is the right one in terms of direction. Are we going to rely on people in this room trying to improve their own career, trying to make money for themselves, trying to start their own business, trying to do better at what they do and what they're trained for and what you're here early in the morning in Detroit learning about doing. We're gonna rely on you to come up with the ideas or are we gonna have state government pick the cool things, right? I would bet that one third of the room selected at random will do better over the next 20 years trying to do their best than, you know, 20 experts selected by the state government. And that's, I'd say the same thing if I was in Massachusetts or North Carolina, Virginia, states that I, I said here were doing well in some areas. Because it comes down fundamentally to what Adam Smith pointed out 200 years ago. People trying to do their best for themselves and their own families and their own businesses are smarter and are better than government experts, even myself. I mean, that, our company does consulting work. We do work for governments. We don't propose that we'll come up with a command and control plan that we design. If I pick the smartest people I can think of in the whole state and put myself on the panel with them, we would still come up with an inferior plan to run the economy than people running their own businesses. We're not capable of doing it as humans. Any government panel's not gonna do it. It's failed every time it's been tried. We do have in Michigan, I and mean, hey, Michigan, we have a tremendous historical legacy of entrepreneurship. I mean, this, this is the state that produced the man of the century from that Fortune uh, magazine identified, Henry Ford. And you just run down the list of entrepreneurs and people that change society and everything. And they started it here, and we have that spirit. And when we start to say, oh, no, we're going to have the state government pick this stuff, well, now we're back to the 1800s and the state government deciding that canals are the next big thing. We should tax ourselves and make the Michigan Canal Company, which is what we did. We almost went bankrupt doing it. I don't think that's the way to, the way to work in the future. The way to the future is to rely on people in this room who are doing what they want to do because they want to do it and risking their own money, putting their own heart and soul into it, those are the folks that will help us succeed. And if they happen to do it in a cool city, great. If they happen to do it in an uncool city, they'll make it cool. Good morning. Yep. Uh, understanding that government doesn't do well at picking winners and losers in the marketplace, would you agree that the MEDC is a good place to perhaps start cutting 
And if so, how much would that save, do you think? I should just clarify uh, the question, MEDC, meaning Michigan Economic Development Corporation. All right. There are, a couple, there are some things that the MEDC, I think, does quite well. Uh, they historically have done well. I uh, think Patrick, every could you just clarify for okay. a little bit what is this? Uh, actually, I'll give you a little tour of history because it goes back to your question. Michigan, like every state, has had some department that was was uh, charged with advocating business growth in its in its state, uh, and uh, since the 1980s, it's been standard for that department to also advertise, advocate, try to encourage other employers to come to that state, and and Michigan's had one, and it should have one. In the 1980s, we had the Department of Commerce. You notice we don't have a Department of Commerce anymore. This is not an accident. The Department of Commerce got a bunch of money, uh, and it was advertising Michigan. And then it became obvious that it was advertising Michigan during an election year to people in Michigan. I don't know any of you maybe have longer memories, but in the 1980s, you would hear in an election year advertisements about how great Michigan was and how great the governor was. And the governor, I think the one I remember was the governor will invite you to come to Michigan. It, you know, it didn't take people too long to figure out that we were now using taxpayer dollars to essentially encourage people to vote for a particular individual. That's against the law. It's against our society. But because it was kind of, you know, I'm sure there were somebody in Wisconsin that heard the same radio ad that ran on the Michigan-Wisconsin border. Uh, you know, it had some small benefit. So when Governor Engler was elected, they abolished the Department of Commerce. So we had no Department of Commerce for a while. And then uh, Governor Engler eventually decided that he wanted to have uh, an aggressive agency promoting Michigan. So they constituted the MEDC. They created that particular body with some insulation between the uh, state government officials and them so now the body the, there's actually a board and they appoint the chair and not all of them are government employees uh, it's some insulation it's it's not entire insulation the current the current chair i think is in the governor's cabinet and is a very sharp individual jim Apolito. Uh, i think we do need to have an agency that advertises us to other other states or investors in other states we should have an agency that that to the extent we can rolls out the red carpet. We should have an agency that supports local governments in their efforts to rejuvenate. I don't think, I said earlier, I don't think having them pick the cities that are cool and implicitly pick the cities that are uncool was a good approach, but there is a role for that. Where we have trouble is two areas. One, when we start advertising in election years or as happened last year when we appear to be in a rush to distribute money in election year through the 20th Century Job Fund. And I'm not saying anybody broke any laws on that. I just think that that is too tempting. And historically, governments have not been able to resist the temptation to reward their political constituencies. You have a pot of money and you're gonna give it out through a government agency somehow has just appeared historically in Michigan and every other state country that the money ends up or large amounts of it end up in political supporters hands. Those are generally not the best entrepreneurs. They're good at politics, but they're not the best entrepreneurs. So that's one problem. Uh, and that's an area where I, I think the government should, should not put resources. The second area is in the, the granting of so-called mega grants the large tax exemptions. This isn't so much an MEDC budget issue, it's a whether or not we're gonna rely on this strategy. And for example, we had a, last year we had a big splashy announcement about Google coming to Ann Arbor. And there was a very large mega grant given. So our tax dollars directly or indirectly supporting the, this particular company becoming an employer in Ann Arbor. Right, so I'm glad Google came to the, to the state of Michigan, but I'm extremely skeptical that this was a successful effort. Here's why. Google wanted to come to Michigan anyways. 
we didn't need, in my opinion, to spend that kind of money to lure a high-tech classified ad campaign set of jobs to Ann Arbor. I'm glad they're there. Our company uses Google AdWords, so I mean, I'm a customer, so the ultimate market test is I think it's a good service at Anderson Economic Group. We actually hire that, and I'm glad those jobs are there. But the, it, the emphasis on having government use our tax dollars to attract headline-getting companies that might actually bring only a relatively small number of jobs to the state, and those jobs weren't really high-tech jobs. Uh, you know what Google AdWords is? Okay, you've probably seen it. It's a, it's a very nice service. We use it. It's classified advertising. Okay. It's good, but it is not path-breaking technology. Uh, and uh, we spent an awful lot of time and effort getting that employer there. I would much rather have spent that kind of time, effort, mental focus on getting our business tax system in line, avoiding talk about payless paydays, telling the rest of the country that we had a plan to get out of our economic mess. These are things that really matter. And part of the problem with relying on the, you know, the, the Hail Mary pass from your economic development agency is that it, 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 it avoids, evades your responsibility for running every play, you know, to, to push the football metaphor. You have to run every play, offense and defense. You can't just sit there and think you're going to throw the long bomb in the fourth quarter. And we seem to be wanting the headline-grabbing ones. And every once in a while, we get one. And that's good. But if we fail on all the fundamentals, we will fall behind. And that's exactly what we're doing right now. We're falling further and further behind on the most fundamental things of government. We overtax people. We provide poor K-12 education. And now we're even talking about not paying our bills closing down offices, shutting down government. This, these are fundamental failures that are so much more damaging to us than getting a Google or a Yahoo will be. So, I don't really think, get back to the MED in MEDC in particular, it's not so much an MEDC budget issue. It's a focus of government issue. Do we want to get in the top 10 are willing to do what it takes to get there? Or are we going to do more flashy things that provide, make it look like we're getting there. I think it's pretty clear we need to do the things that solve our structural problems. That's how we'll get in the winner's circle. Yes? I like you, Mr. Anderson, um, and perplexed by the K-12 problem in Michigan. Do you have an understanding of how Michigan's private and parochial schools are doing in comparison to Michigan's K-12 public system? Uh, I have a little bit of information on that. On that. We, were, we actually tried to do the comparison, including the, the private schools, uh, because private schools are part of our education system. And they're part of an education system that does extremely well for the families that can afford to pay for that and fulfills a great number of missions. A lot of people go to private schools because their church or, or their uh, other people have charitably supported that institution. And, uh, you know, in my family, we've sent our kids sometimes to public schools, sometimes to private schools, so we have our experience also. Right now, there's not the direct comparable data, so we can't do the attainment information. Can we put up the, oh, you've got this or the one with the reading and this, the, this particular set of tests we couldn't break out with uh, with private schools, so we couldn't use it here. But that's, that's the national comparison. Here's the information we know. In Detroit, people are abandoning the public schools. Detroit, by the way, is not a low-spending school district. It has historically been a high-spending school district in a very high-spending school state. It's not a funding issue in Detroit. Individual parents are making tough emotional decisions about their kids. Their tough decisions are they are leaving a system because the system's failing them. 
that is occurring in other locations also. And, and a lot of times people who send their kids to private schools go through a great deal of sacrifice. And most of these private schools, we've done some comparisons of it, they typically spend about 50% of what the public school does. And, and you, you, it's hard to see exactly what they spend because there tends to be a charitable contribution from some entity as well as tuition. And the teachers tend to accept much less in pay but I think that the private schools are, are a tremendous part of our society. They're, you know, they date back to before the, the public school system. We've got 150 years plus of uh, private schools and a shorter time period of public schools. And they're very important and I think they're doing an excellent job under difficult conditions. And when you have failure in the public system, it's, we're very fortunate that we have private schools that are doing it. And the ultimate test there is not something I can get as statistics. It's the individual decision of parents that are saying, even though it costs us more and we're going to have a smaller gymnasium and less fancy things and we're not going to have the media room and we're not going to have all this, we're still going to spend our hard-earned money to send our kid here. And that, to me, you have to respect the decision of the parents. And the parents are saying it's worth a lot to them. Okay. Yes? Since... Uh business taxes are ultimately passed on to someone else. Uh, is any consideration being given to eliminating business tax, any business tax? And if not, why not? That's a good question. Uh, and in our, in our benchmarking study, we're very clear. Every single business tax is passed on to, a, to an individual person. There is no such thing as a tax that ultimately is paid by a nameless, faceless business somewhere that no person pays. So we're we're very clear on that in, in the report. We identified business taxes as taxes here that the initial incidence was on business. So we, we used, uh, in the comparison, the single business tax, for example, the personal property tax. Personal property tax is a tax on every chair, laptop, computer. By the way, if your laptop is owned by a business, paying a tax on that, uh, every machine, earth moving equipment, junkyard dogs are taxed technically. If you have a dog, protects the junkyard, it's taxed under Michigan's personal property tax law. Uh, that kind of tax, those are initial incidents business, all of which are passed on to either employees or consumers or investors. So we make that clear. We pointed out the the, the, the comparison of the business taxes because we felt that that was important to look at, at uh, just that subset. Uh, your next question was, is anybody considering eliminating them entirely? Economists consider that. I would have to say that the, your, your, your idea is one that is, you know, sound economically and, and generally uh, politicians are just find this impossible to think about how they do it. Because it's still too easy to say, we're going to cut taxes on, on workers and raise taxes on nameless, faceless businesses. Uh, so unfortunately, there's not a real discussion about becoming completely honest about our tax system. But this business tax debate about whether we're reducing or increasing business taxes is a live one. And I want to point out to you one thing that is a live debate that maybe there was some encouragement. Huh. In the proposal for the governor's plan, can you back up to the governor's plan? It's actually in the document uh, about the excise tax, the proposed excise tax on business to business services. So your, your business hires an economist, firm like ours, we go out and help you locate where, locate your business. You pay it, you would have paid a 2% tax and if we also hired somebody to come to work for us, there'd be 2% tax on that. So that it would compound all the way through, pyramid we call it. Uh, in, the, in the document that proposed this plan, there was the following statement, which was that the majority of these taxes would be paid by businesses, so there'd be limited effect on individuals, right? That has gone over like a lead balloon. Hopefully that's an encouraging sign that people saw through that and said, there is no way I'm going to pass all these on to nameless, faceless businesses. I'm going to pay those and I don't like it. So that's a live debate right there. Uh, this is something that is being discussed right now and we all have a chance to discuss it. Okay. 
We have time for one. Uh, sure. One? Okay. One more question for Mr. Anderson. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's, it's interesting to me, uh, when we plan the seminars, uh, we're not quite sure how the different talks will blend together, but I think uh, I see a direct connection between uh, this morning's presentation and some of the things that uh, were raised by Marva Collins yesterday. And uh, so it's always a pleasure to see that, uh, you know, the, the things that we talk about in here are, are important issues from a number of perspectives. So I hope you found uh, something useful this morning. In uh, the break, we're going to have a slightly longer break because uh, we are finishing a little early this morning. There will be refreshments served, so help yourself. They should be in the punch train room right off the lobby here. So uh, see you promptly. Uh, when, it's 10.15, the next 10.15. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, 10.30. Thanks, Bert. <laughs>